And here we go. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Big Idea. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic here in Spokane, where we talk about how a little problem at the interface where your head meets your spine can actually have very big problems that permeate and show up in all kinds of different ways throughout your body, ways that you would never think are actually associated with the health of your neck. And what we're going to be talking about in this particular video here are going to be two very common and interrelated symptoms, dizziness and anxiety. And by the end of this video, I think you'll appreciate how is it the two of these things can oftentimes go together. Your body to a certain degree is playing a trick on your brain. And it can be very frustrating because we oftentimes are going to want to look to outside sources for the dizziness or for the anxiety. So we're going to look at triggers of the environment. We're going to be looking at brain MRI as different things like that. When the truth is, is that it could actually be coming from a different part of your body entirely. So we're going to give you just a, a little bit of a review in terms of how is that possible in the first place and then show you a case that we had taken care of some years ago because it gives us a, a little bit of a few clues in terms of when and how we can look at things to appreciate what's going on. So let's get right to it. All right, so first up, here we have a, a new piece of um, basically research here, suboccipital muscles, forward head posture, and cervicogenic dizziness. This article, in all honesty, is not really talking about anything new. I've talked about this in other videos. But again, we've got more evidence that talks about how a dizzy and an anxiety kind of symptom can actually be related to your neck. So I'm just going to read, not the whole thing, don't worry about that. But it's going to set the stage for everything we're going to talk about through the rest of this video here, okay? Dizziness or vertigo can be caused by dysfunction of the vestibular or non-vestibular systems. In other words, it can be your inner ear mechanism or it can be coming from somewhere else. I oftentimes will say your body playing a trick on your brain. The diagnosis, treatment, and mechanism of dizziness or vertigo caused by vestibular dysfunction has been described in detail. So that is you have an MRI in the brain, you can see something weird going on. However, dizziness by the non-vestibular system, especially cervicogenic dizziness, is not well known. This paper explained the cervicogenic dizziness caused by abnormal sensory input with reference to several studies among neck or head and neck muscles, suboccipital muscles act as stabilizers and controllers of the head. Structural and functional changes of the suboccipital muscles can induce dizziness, especially myodural bridges and activation of trigger point stimulated by abnormal head posture may be associated with cervicogenic dizziness. Now, one of the things that this article talks about pretty much right off the bat is it's relating to muscles. It's saying that there are problems with the muscles that are supporting the vertebrae in the upper part of the neck, and that in turn is having an impact on sense of balance and also as it can relate to anxiety. Well, how and why is that possible in the first place? Okay, so we have in our neck, we have three different primary kinds of sensory nerve receptors. That is receptors going from the neck back up to the brain. These are gonna be your pain receptors, first and foremost, they're known as uh, nociceptors. So they're detecting physical damage and the brain interprets it as pain. The second time or second type is what is known as a proprioceptor. A proprioceptor, think of it as posturoreceptor, and these are going to be involved with muscle tone and tension. And it's giving your brain information about where your body is in open space. And the third kind is what's known as a pressure receptor. And these are going to be detecting physical movements. Now, the important thing is it relates to dizziness and also to anxiety. First and foremost, the network for processing this kind of information in our brain is absolutely huge. If you talk about the processes and the parts of the brain that are involved with basically pain sensation, 
in order for us as human beings to be able to operate bipedally, that is walking and keeping our head upright over the top of our shoulders, if that's the area that we think of as pain, this is the area that we're thinking of in terms of being able to maintain our balance and our equilibrium. There is way more, way more process that's actually involved. But here's the thing. We don't feel it necessarily. A lot of times as human beings, we think, oh, okay, well, if I'm not having pain, there's not really a problem. But the point being is, is you don't have to have pain. There could be all kinds of other stuff that's still going on. And what it's going to do is it's going to significantly decrease your brain's bandwidth if you are either A, getting abnormal information, or B, your brain is being bombarded with too much information. And so many of these different neurological processes, they actually overlap and connect with other parts of the brain that are involved with the activation of our sympathetics. And that's going to be important in just a little bit here. My point being just at this point is that there is a lot more information as it relates to muscle tone and as it relates to balance than there is in pain per se. So the thing about it is the top vertebrae in your neck, so they're called the C1 and the C2, they do not actually have a disc that locks them into place. There's no intervertebral disc. They are effectively supported and suspended by muscles and ligaments. And what those muscles do is they actually are serving not for producing primary movements, but instead they are used as nerve receptor organs. They give the information to your brain about where your neck and your body are relative to the horizon so that you can stay upright, keeping your head level versus, you know, kinked or twisted, something like that. Because if and when your head is kinked and twisted, something like that, what that can do is that can exert a mechanical tension which starts to pull and irritate on your spinal cord itself, which can affect any number of different neurological processes in your body. That's what the author in this article is talking about, what's known as a myodural bridge. The connection between the bone itself onto the neurology that can actually produce an issue. But for right now, let's just simply focus on those muscles, okay, and those muscle receptors. So they are extremely dense, extremely dense in the upper part of your neck. And they're going to go, again, to the parts of your brain that are involved with balance, equilibrium, but they're also somewhat involved in vision. And so point being is that if there's ever a disruption and suddenly your brain is receiving abnormal information from your neck to your brain, your eyes can go blurry. Your balance, even if it's not true vertigo, you can start to feel like you're kind of on a rocky boat like that. It can also produce symptoms associated with brain fog. Lots of different things that, again, person thinking, what is wrong with me? It can produce headaches, it can produce migraines, it can produce all kinds of different things like that. But again, this is overloaded circuitry because of things going funny in the neck. First and foremost, and I repeat, unless you're having a headache or a migraine, there's not always going to be pain associated with this. Now, the next part then that's worth considering here is when you start to have abnormalities with blood flow going up to the brain. So what I'm going to grab here is I'm going to grab a, a little model, and this is going to illustrate for you the, the top vertebra in the neck here, and then I've got the second one here like that. So these are the areas that are involved with the ability to nod your head up and down, which actually occurs at the skull, it's right here. But then the ability of you to be able to turn your head. 50% of all emotion happens right at this little spot right here. And you might see that on the back side, the back side of the vertebra, there is this little groove located right here. What that groove contains is that contains what's known as your vertebral artery. It's the artery that is supplying, well, it's a pair of arteries, duh. But pair of arteries, they supply about a third of all of the blood to your brain. But this is the important thing, is they are effectively the primary supply of all, all, all the blood that goes to your brain stem, which are all of your vital life centers, which includes the different clusters of cells that are involved with balance and equilibrium. And it's also going to be the one that's going to your cerebellum, which is the one that's involved with fine motor control. So we can appreciate, should there be a disruption 
to blood flow going to the brain. And it doesn't mean necessarily that the artery is getting completely compressed or completely crushed. No, if that's the case, that's going to be straight out dangerous. But we're talking about if it should normally be capable of transmitting 100% blood flow, if it's down and it can only transmit, let's say, 95%. Okay, that may not be enough to kill you, but if that's not enough, in that moment, your brain is going to say, hey, what's the issue? And if they're not having either the right amount of blood flow going up or down, that can manifest as different, weird kind of symptoms. Dizziness vertigo is going to be a super common one. Now, how, oh, how then does this relate to the symptom of anxiety? Because so far we've been talking about dizziness. Okay, A. Find me a person who experiences vertigo or dizziness who doesn't feel a sense of apprehension about their symptoms. That is the abnormal person. And this is very important because we don't ever want to confuse cause and effect. The symptom of anxiety is an effect. It's not primary cause. However, anxiety when triggered can make a person feel dizzier. And the dizzier can make a person then feel more anxious. And so it becomes this unfortunate positive feedback loop that just keeps feeding on itself. Now, as it relates to the neurology of this, you might remember that there was a third kind of sensory nerve receptor that we talked about. And that's going to be what's called a pressure receptor. Okay. Now, pressure receptors, they're involved in all of the tissues of your body. But I want you to think also of pressure receptors because they are going to be receiving information as it relates to changes in blood flow and as it relates also to what are known as sympathetic nerve fibers. What's a sympathetic nerve fiber? A sympathetic nerve fiber comes from your brain and it controls the normal regulation of every single blood vessel in your body, including this vertebral artery that we are talking about right here. And so, what did we say? Your brain is not stupid. It's going to be aware that if there's a disruption, even 5%, which is so small, you would not be able to see that on an MRI, on an ultrasound, unless it's very, very significantly getting choked or blocked off. But again, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a functional disruption. Your nerve system, these pressure receptors, will be able to see that. And they're going to detect that information and they're going to transmit it back up to your brain in the form where it's pooled and dumped in along all of this pressure receptor information. And there are going to be parts of your brain that will receive that and are going to try to say, okay, hey, we need to make a change with the physiology here. But because it is activating and synapsing with the parts that are involved with the sympathetics, the sympathetics are part of your fight, flight, freeze mechanism, the activation of blood flow, and it affects your physiology in terms of how you feel. And if it starts overloading those circuits, very common where a person starts to feel a sense of anxiety. So what it is, again, think of it to a certain degree as a silent alarm system. Your brain is receiving the information, something's not right, something's not right, something's not right, and you feel it. What you are feeling is really palpable. But it is not necessarily what you think it is. And this is why I sometimes will talk about it as if your body is playing a trick on your brain. Your body's not really playing a trick on your brain. It's giving you a warning about something that is real and genuine. But we don't know what it needs. And so we're assigning it to outside circumstance. Why? Because outside circumstance certainly triggers it. If you're already in this agitated or anxious kind of state, and I really hate using the word anxiety, so I'll prefer to use the word angst where I can. But it means that your threshold is lowered because of what's going on inside you. Then it doesn't take near as much, whether it's caffeine, whether it's a little fright, whether it's stress, and that, boom, pushes you over the edge. And then that triggers the sensation of the anxiety within you, which in turn makes the dizzy sensation worse, and then there's the positive feedback loop right there. So all of this coming because of potentially what's going on on the in, inner side part of your neck. Now, there's one more thing that I do want to show you here because this I think is super useful in terms of understanding what the nature and the issue of dizziness and anxiety are. And it has to do with 
a rotational problem that we see at C1 and C2. So let me grab my little model here again for you. So we're looking at the backside right through here. So here's the top vertebra again, here's the C2 vertebra. Now these vertebrae are normally designed to be able to rotate on each other like this. Again, that's what lets us rotate our head. Now here is the problem, is if you were to keep your head like this 24 seven, okay, that can potentially create some issues. So we're not talking about things where they're broken or dislocated. And the C1, the C2, this is also very important is that this area is the grand compensation mechanism for any kind of mechanical strain in your body. Why? It's the only joint that moves this way. And so what that means, it means that this is not typically the primary problem. And sometimes people say, oh, it's because of instability between the C1 and the C2. I would disagree with that. I would argue it's because this area is trying to compensate for something else that is not moving enough. And the consequence, the way that your brain tries to compensate for it, is it produces this little bit of rotation like that. Now, if that's only for a couple minutes, usually no problem. But if this is persistent over days, weeks, months, even years, think about what this is doing. First and foremost, to the muscles, because you do have muscles that connect between the two like that. It's called an obliquus capitis inferior. Don't worry about the name, but most amount of those proprioceptors out of any of the muscles that are located in the upper part of your neck. And so if that muscle is under constant tension, guess what? That is a primary source for something that can cause a person to feel dizzy. Don't believe me? Quickly turn your head back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You're going to activate that muscle like it's nobody's business. But imagine that it's triggered 24-7. That's issue number one. And again, it's not necessarily the muscle, but it's about the nerve receptors in the muscle that are producing the issues. In addition to that, we have those vertebral arteries that are supplying the blood up to the brain. And what this does is that can diminish the flow on one side. Again, even if it's not to the point of absolute collapse, if your brain needs 100% blood, but it's only getting 95 those nerve receptors, they're going to let your brain know there's a problem. We're not getting what it's supposed to get. And that is going to be potentially then producing some of the issues. So the point being is that even though C1 and C2 rotation may not necessarily be the primary problem, it's the window that can give us a better understanding about what is going on. Because if we can figure out why is your body compensating this way, that gives us a lot better indication about what we need to do to be able to help you out. So in that regard here now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull open a case where I can show you a couple of preliminary things that we saw for a, a young gentleman, he was really only about 20 years old, who was experiencing both dizziness and also anxiety. He was a fellow who was working on uh, computers pretty much all day. And certainly one of the triggers that, you know, he was commonly dealing with were the, the fluoro lights and the flicker rates on the, the computer screens. They weren't agreeing with him. But in the same breath, he'd been doing this for years and years and years. And so why was this happening more all of a sudden? Well, no matter how strong and resilient your body is, eventually it's going to get when there's long enough stress. And so I'm not going to show you the, the detailed views that we took where we could actually see the individual misalignments, but I am going to show you a couple of the preliminary things that we could see even on his standard kind of x-rays that let us know that there was an issue that was going on in that area. So let's go have a look. All right. So first what we have here is we have a, a side view of this young fellow's neck. So what we're looking at is skull. So this is going to be the front, this is going to be the back. The C1 vertebra in its side profile right here, the C2, 3, 4, and so forth and so forth. So this gives us a, a very good representation about where he is, the health of the bones, the joints, the discs, and also the overall curve of in the neck, which is a reflection of the amount of tension on the muscles, ligaments, and nerves. So a couple of things. One, eh, that's a little bit straighter than it should be. Number two is that if we're looking at the spaces between the vertebra, 
especially right here between the C3 and the C4, we see where the body is laying down little spicules of extra bone. Even at 20 years old, he's showing signs of degenerative wear and tear. Arthritis is not caused by a person getting old. It's caused when there's an old injury that's not healing the right way and the body is trying to lay down more calcium in order to stabilize it as best as it can. So here he is 20 years old already showing signs of this. Now, I can tell you looking at that, that's not a process that happens overnight. So even though when he had first come to see us, he'd only started experiencing these symptoms for about uh, a month or so, that right there, that takes at le that represents at least 10 years worth of accumulated stress. And so I can look at this and say, you had some kind of a physical injury in the past, didn't break, didn't dislocate, and it's not unstable either, but it's creating a problem. And the reason that this matters is it represents then where there is physical damage. And what did we say? Where there's physical damage, your brain and your body are going to have to find ways of compensating for that and that ultimately can show up at the c1 and the c2 kind of area in other words okay so this is pointing there's definitely something going on in the neck now in addition to that i want to point out this little structure located right there you might remember when we were playing around with the model of the c1 vertebra before and i'll hold it so it's the same kind of profile we're looking at it from the side and I said, this is where that vertebral artery lives in this little groove located right here. But you'll note that as I'm holding it, there's not this rounded part that you actually see right through here. It makes kind of this little dark hole. What is that? That is what's called a ponticle formation. And what it is, is because you can't see all tissues on x-rays here but in this space is a ligament and the ligament here is designed to be flexible to provide support and stability and what can happen is if there is constant chronic stress or tension then that can actually start to put pressure on those arteries, those veins, and also the nerves that are located in that area. And that, of course, is not going to be a good thing. So, again, the brain, in its innate intelligence, what is it going to do? It's going to say, hmm, we got an issue here. We need to protect this. And so what it will do it will, it will actually start to lay down a deposit of calcium that acts as a barrier to protect those arteries, veins, and nerves that are located right in that spot. So when we see this formation, again, we know that there is chronic tension in this area. Again, this doesn't happen overnight. That takes years to develop and suggests again, okay, this fellow, even at only 20 years old, he had something that was going on. And when a ponical formation is present like this, it's associated with lots and lots of different symptoms. So headaches, migraines, vertigo, dizziness, also anxiety. So the question is, is it causal or is it an effect? And again, this is where I think a lot of times people get it backwards. What a large amount of the research says is that when you see that, that's a risk factor for these kinds of conditions. Okay, yeah, to a certain degree that makes sense. So if you've got the artery that's normally going to be contained in this kind of a space right here, it means that if there's ever subtle little deviations, there's not going to be near as much wiggle room. And as a consequence, it means that that threshold before you can start to have issues is actually lowered. But let's come back to what I had said just a couple minutes ago. Why does the body lay down calcium in the first place? It's doing that to provide support and stability. So I would argue that when you see the development of a ponical formation, that in and of itself is an effect. It's not a cause. The brain is recognizing that unless we do that, and unless we're willing to you know, give up some of our flexibility, the tension we have in that area that we can't dissipate is going to be kind of a big deal and is going to be causing many more kinds of problems. So when we see that, that oftentimes is a very useful hint that suggests to us something is not right between the skull and the C1 vertebra. So what can we see when we're looking at this young fellow's 
x-ray right here. We're seeing that there's a potential issue between the skull and the C1, or at least there's tension through there. Otherwise, that formation of bone doesn't exist. And we can also see that there is this early sign of degenerative wear and tear going on down between his C3 and his C4. And I would argue there's probably also a little bit going on between his C2 and his C3 as well. Now, as this then relates to this space right here, that area between the C1 and between the C2, remembering that that area is going to be the compensator, we can look on another view and that gives us an insight in terms of what's going on right there. And so what we can do is we can flip the image. So now we're looking at things front on. This is going to be the left side. This is going to be the, the right side. We had done a few additional views to make sure that you didn't have any cranial asymmetries um, that could affect what we're seeing here. So what you see is basically what you get because he doesn't have any of that weird kind of stuff going on. So the first thing that you'll notice is this quite significant amount of head tilt. When we took this picture, I didn't try to remove any of that. I said, I want you to sit in whatever feels most neutral and natural for you. And so when we see head tilt like this, that is a sign that those nerve receptors, remember what we said about muscle tone, proprioceptors, they're sending the brain abnormal information and the brain says, yep, things are normal, when clearly they're not. Now, what I'm also going to do here is I'm going to zoom in on this picture just a wee little bit. Whoops, that's the wrong button. There we go. There we go. There we go. Now, I don't expect everybody to know what you're looking at right here. But in brief, I'll point out left eye socket, right eye socket, the nose and the sinuses here. And this is where it's kind of a little bit tricky because unless you've looked at these views, you have to be able to look through the windows of the sinuses, it can be a little tricky. But what we are aiming to do is we are aiming to look front view on of the relationship of the C1 and the C2 like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little markup tool here. Hopefully it'll work all right for us. Where what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline this is where the C1 is sitting, something like that. And then we're going to do something like this on the opposite side. Not exact, but it gives you the idea. And in fact, on this view, we can actually see it's located right here. There's the extra little bit of attachment where we could see the back part of that bone that was forming that pontical formation. So this is where that C1 vertebra, think of it to a certain degree like a bow tie, right about there. That's how that's sitting relative to the base of the skull. And then this is going to be approximate midline, something like that. Not exactly straight, but we do the best that we can. Now, the next thing that we looked at is we looked at the relative position of that C2 vertebra. And we were looking at it from behind kind of like this. So we're looking for that part of the bone right there. If you would, a peg with a spiky bit on the back. So what we found was we found the peg located right about here. That wasn't too hard. The spiky bit is right here. And there can be a lot of reasons why it's not always central, but in his particular case, again, we had a look and it's not because of some kind of cranial asymmetry or anything like that. So what we see here is we're seeing from a front pers or from a back perspective like this, that there is a rotation that's occurring effectively like this. And what that means is it means that the, relatively speaking, that the top vertebra on the right side is going forward, and then the C2 on the left side is going forward as it's producing this rotation. Now think about what that is doing then to those muscles and what that's gonna mean to those nerve receptors going up to the brain. Constant tension produces trigger points, produces abnormal posture, and is also bombarding the brain with abnormal proprioceptive information. And if that rotation is pronounced enough and lasts long enough, especially if he's doing a lot of work where he might be using two screens and turning his head like this, if he's turning his head all day without knowing this, over and over like that, that's producing more stress, more strain, more overload of all of that. And if, if 
that is agitating because he already has that pontical formation and it means that he doesn't have that normal flexibility or that give. And if that is irritating those sympathetic nerve fibers and that's being detected, that's going to go back up to the brain and it can manifest as a sense not only of dizziness, but also then of internal angst where his body is giving him a warning sign that something is going wrong. So what we had done at this point is we had seen, okay, yeah, there's, you know, we had done a physical assessment for him first. So we knew there was something going wrong with the neck. We took these preliminary pictures so that that way we could verify, yeah, there's something going on. We're seeing the evidence of this C1, C2 rotation. And then what we did is we took the more detailed views so that we could see what exactly was going on between the skull and the C1 and then between that C3 and that C4. And that was really the, the key there. This phenomenon that I'm showing you right here, that was nothing more than the compensation. So we didn't focus here because again, a lot of times, quote unquote, C1, C2 instability isn't the primary issue. That's how the body's trying to compensate for these things. And what we found is that when we were able to adjust him at the top, and then we were able to basically address that lower down misalignment at the same time, effectively what that did, and we didn't redo films on him because he was doing very, very well clinically. There was no reason. But what we believe or hypothesize that if we'd have done that, we would have actually seen that that joint space would have come back and that the tip of that that we're showing basically sitting right here would have come back more into that neutral orientation because we would have been able to address that issue that was going on to produce the symptoms. So it's for this reason that I'll oftentimes talk about the C1 and the C2. Not only are they super important from a, a muscular or ligamentous and a neurological perspective, but it's effectively it's the body's balancing account. And by understanding what's going on at that area and appreciating all of the different structures, how they affect tension on the nerves, tension on the spinal cord, and how that can manifest as all kinds of different symptoms. Again, many people don't recognize dizziness or anxiety as being related to the neck. But when we understand how all of these things are interconnected, we can see, ah, there could very well be an issue there. And by understanding that area, it gives us a much better opportunity about what is necessary and what's needed in order to be able to help bring a person's body back to equilibrium. When that happens, guess what? The internal alarm system doesn't need to keep going off. And the person's physiology is able to come back towards neutral natural. That's the way that we're looking to ultimately help. And so I hope that this video here if you are experiencing either of these dizziness or anxiety kinds of symptoms, it gives you a bit of a hope and understanding about how it is that by addressing the upper part of the neck that can make a bigger difference towards improving your overall quality of life. So, hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have, and always do, like and subscribe. It helps the YouTube algorithm recognize that this is valuable so that other people can find this. Two is if you've got friends or family where it's like, okay, yeah, this might be a little bit technical, but, you know, check this out. This might be something to help, uh, help you. Please do share this video with them. And last but certainly not least is if you identify, okay, hey, I'm experiencing some of these issues. A couple of things, depending on where you are. So if you are not in the greater Spokane area in uh, Washington State, I'll recommend that what you do is you go to BlairChiropractic.com where you can find a directory for people in the United States and around the world who are doing this kind of work where it might be able to help you out. Now, if of course you are in the local area, then please do get in contact with me. You can either go to my website direct, which is drjeffreyhanna.com, which is where I've got a bunch of blog articles, videos just like this one, lots, lots, lots more information. And there's a little form that you can fill that out to get in touch with me. Personally, happy to have a chat. But if you're thinking, nope, I want to go ahead and get things started, then what you do is you would give our offices a ring. We've got two locations up in the north at Mead, and we've got one at the south, South Hill, south, obviously, where you can just uh, give us a call. We'll be happy to coordinate an appointment, have a chat, find out what we can do to help you out. You go to clearchirospokane.com, or you call us direct at 509 315 8166. We'll be happy to help you out. Make sure that you mention that you watched, you saw this video, and 
Maybe not any special favors, but that way I will know to have a, a personal lookout for you and we will do the very best that we can to help you out. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic in Spokane. Get well, live well, stay well. So until next time, take care. Bye-bye.